All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for coming back for this uh, session on uh, hemostatic resuscitation for traumatic uh, hemorrhagic shock. This is, so I'll clearly be talking about pediatric uh, care later. So just uh, by way of introduction, I'm actually a pediatric critical care uh, physician. I uh, was active duty Army uh, for 12 years and deployed uh, to Iraq in 04, 05. And it's interesting, uh, with my pediatric training, in Philadelphia, we used whole blood uh, for cardiac surgery in children every day. So using whole blood to resuscitate for hemor post-operative hemorrhagic shock was natural and normal for me. I go to Baghdad 0405, and it was right, after, right when Fallujah uh, went to hell, April of 04, if any of you were military and remember it. We had many, many casualties coming in uh, with hemorrhagic shock, and at that point, we had no source of platelets uh, in, in theater. So while some of the other docs I was with were knowledgeable, well, knew we could use whole blood, it was my experience as a pediatric critical care doc that helped really um, advocate and push for using whole blood uh, more often that year. And that kind of led to the entire, well, with, with many influences from many other people. I'm not saying it was about me pushing it. Uh, but a group of us really kind of pushed the, the envelope when it comes to resuscitating patients with hemorrhagic shock. That's, just, that's kind of why a pediatric ICU doctor is talking to you about uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock, predominantly in an adult population. So my talk uh, now is about the THOR itself and the rationale uh, for using whole blood for hemorrhagic shock. We were asked uh, to give a little bit of background about THOR, in case you're having not familiar with it. Uh, THOR is, is an international multidisciplinary multi network of both civilian and military uh, providers. We have a wide range of, of members within the group, we, between medics, paramedics, you know, all the way to all different types of physicians, whether it be emergency medicine, anesthesia, surgeons, uh, et cetera. And we also have you know, basic scientists that come to the group, that come to the meetings, and participate you know, all the way to clinical uh, trialists. Our vision within Thor has always been to uh, improve outcomes uh, for, for uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock by optimizing the acute phase of resuscitation. Our mission uh, is to develop and implement the best practices for pre-hospital through the completion of the acute uh, phase of hemorrhagic shock resuscitation, and we plan to do this, or we do do this, through research, training, uh, education, and advocacy. We often also get asked, um, how did this start? You know, uh, why is this uh, network based out of Norway and why is, why is Phil and Gare running this network? Well, it all comes down to communication, someone reaching out to another. In, two th in October of 2010, I get an email, and it's from Gare Strandinus. He says, Phil, I've read your whole blood publications. I think they're great. Um, it's probably drunk at the time. And, you know, would you be willing to help me? and actually uh, be the chair of my scientific steering committee because uh, I want to do more whole blood research. So I thought about it for about a half a second and said yes. Now, how often does a Norwegian a Navy SEAL commander ask you to help him, help him out uh, to help train his medics? So that's how we met through email. We wound up, you know, very, um, you know, um, ironically uh, meeting in Innsbruck for the first time uh, when I was asked to present at an, uh, one of Dietmar Fries's stop the bleeding uh, meetings to talk about plasma. I was kind of the sacrificial lamb going to his meeting there to talk about plasma. But Gare came down from Norway to meet with me. We went out for a drink that night, and I remember it vividly. We went to Limerick Bill's Irish Bar uh, down the road from, the, from where the conference was, and we started to talk about the, the scientific program we were going to develop and what we we're going to do. And I said, you know, if we're really going to move the needle, on a, for improving outcomes for patients with hemorrhagic shock. We should just start our own network and start to have a meeting in Norway every year. By that time in, in by 2011, I have kind of gotten to know all the major players in, uh, in the field. And we just had a one-day meeting uh, in Bergen in 2011. And that was so successful, we just started to then have a meeting at the Solstrand Spa, which is a little bit south of, of Bergen. And now this year will be our 10th. Uh, year of, of doing it, and um, we haven't looked back uh, since. What's the strength of the network? Just like it is in resuscitation, you know, it's uh, balance. Balance of having uh, the pre-hospital providers there that kind of know what's needed, 
uh, from the scientists. It's uh, having uh, clinical trialists there with basic science docs, uh, et cetera. It's half military, half civilian by design uh, because we need to learn from each other uh, over time. How we've, and, and we've been doing it that way for the past, you know, 100 years or so. Um, so what, does, what do we do within Thor? Our main activity has been, although we're branching out, has been our main, uh, our annual meeting each year uh, in Norway. Uh, from that meeting, uh, we, we publish um, large uh, supplements in um, high impact, well, in, in, in good journals uh, after each year. And then we, and we've been publishing some position papers too, just to kind of help give you all um, references uh, for um, if you want to try to change practice locally, these position papers can help uh, to do that. Now, we've now been branching out and having satellite meetings. We've been to Italy uh, twice. Uh, Switzerland's now here twice. We're going to Brazil in, in May. Um, the AABB is the American Association of Blood Banks, uh, Blood Bankers. Uh, we are now are having a standing meeting with them every year to try to teach the, the transfusion medicine uh, crowd uh, about hemorrhagic shock resuscitation. It's been a great partnership. ISBT is more of a European uh, society, International Society of Blood Transfusion. We're planning uh, to work with them at their meetings every year, uh, too. Uh, the, the medics within the group are developing training material, both uh, text and, and video, to help with uh, training and education for remote damage control resuscitation principles. And then we actually have an entire textbook, a 25-chapter uh, textbook that we are about to uh, publish. Here are just some of the uh, supplement covers that we've uh, published over the years. And here's a position paper on kind of changing the threshold for hypotensive uh, resuscitation. Pat and Gare are going to talk a lot more about that. Here's just what, here's what the textbook is going to look like. Hopefully it'll be out by the end of the year. <laughs> so within uh, Thor, Damage control resuscitation has always kind of been the bundle of care uh, that uh, was meant to reduce death from hemorrhagic shock. But since we started initially, uh, and we still do, focus on the pre-hospital uh, resuscitation, uh, we borrowed a term from the U.S. Army, actually. They coined this, uh, Gerhardt and Blackburn coined remote damage control resuscitation. And that's basically applying DCR principles in the pre-hospital phase of resuscitation. And we feel it's important to, to distinguish RDCR from DCR uh, since um, we're, they're practiced in different environments, so therefore you have different uh, equipment available. Uh, airway management, Gary will talk a lot about this, um, probably should be different in the remote setting versus a hospital setting. And your therapeutic, therapeutic options are often uh, different as well. Another uh, concept, concept we've been promoting is this idea of blood failure. Some people like the term, some people don't, uh, but we like it because what it does, it helps people think about blood as an organ. And there are multiple components of that organ. And when a patient has blood failure, and I'll describe it in a second, it makes you think, okay, so what within, what about the blood organ that's failing needs to be corrected for me to improve outcomes uh, for my patient? So clearly blood, the uh, function of the blood as an organ is to improve O2 delivery, is to main, maintain and regulate hemostasis. The endothelium is a, pla is a platform on, on, upon which hemostasis occurs as well as vasoregulation and uh, immune function is clearly, you know, uh, carried out within uh, blood itself uh, too. So when you think about blood failing and you think about it that way, it allows you to provide a balanced simultaneous treatment of each of the ways a blood can fail. And here's just a schematic of trauma-induced uh, blood failure because your blood can fail from other reasons too, right? So you have the actual the, the blunt or penetrating traumatic injury. That leads to shock. And it's that shock that leads to then endothelial dysfunction, immune dysfunction, and hemostatic dysfunction. And they're all clearly interrelated. So when some people focus on just, you know, the the hemostatic dysfunction, right? There's been a lot of talk about trauma-induced coagulopathy, the acute coagulopathy of trauma, all true and, and important, and they need to be focused on. But if you focus on just that, and you forget about the shock, or you forget about the endotheliopathy, you're going to cause more of an imbalance in the system, or you're going to have a less successful resuscitation uh, over time. <clears throat> 
So again, blood failure is meant for people to think about it, providing a balanced resuscitation, addressing each of these dysfunctional uh, parts of blood function uh, when they occur with shock. So how big of a problem is blood failure, right? Actually, it's interesting. Shock, coagulopathy, uh, endotheliopathy, based upon syndican uh, release, and even immune dysfunction, occurs about 33% of the time for each of these, for patients with severe traumatic injury. So it's, fair, it's very common. And actually, each of them are associated strongly with, with worse outcomes. That might seem obvious to you, but there are, there's clear data showing the more initial shock, coagulopathy, endotheliopathy, and even immune dysfunction, they're all correlated with worse mortality. Therefore, uh, we need to uh, work uh, quickly to reverse those conditions to help imp improve outcomes. At least that's the, that's the theory. So for patients with traumatic uh, hemorrhagic shock, you probably do know the epidemiology, but it's worth going through. It's the most common cause of death from one year of age to, to 46 years of age. Uh, it's, hemorrhage is the most common cause of mentally preventable death. I'm going to go through that, those statistics in, in a few slides later. Um, and you all know hemorrhagic shock, uh, death from hemorrhagic shock occurs really quickly. And even in hospital, it occurs within one to three hours of admission. But I'll show you a slide where the majority of hemorrhagic shock deaths occur pre-hospital. So if we're going to move the needle and improve outcomes for patients with traumatic hemorrhagic shock, we have to start to bring the therapy to the patient. We can't wait for them to get to the hospital. And here's just some data showing you why we need to focus on pre-hospital. The, the vast majority of deaths that occur uh, from uh, hemorrhagic shock are pre-hospital. In the military, uh, KIA is for patients that die pre-hospital before they get to a medical treatment facility. Died of wounds are for patients that die after they get to, in, to the hospital. So if you're thinking about this in civilian terms, KIA is pre-hospital, death of wounds is, um, died of wounds is, is in-hospital deaths. And you can see, I mean, I haven't done the math here, but it's probably at least 66% of, they, of, of their dying pre-hospital, a third are dying uh, in the hospital. So if we're going to improve outcomes, right, we have to do it quickly. The peak here is uh, 30 minutes after injury, okay? And I know in some cities, the transport time is 30 minutes for some patients, but not, but not for all. Right? So even in large cities where your transport time is short, for the patients that have a very high uh, rate of bleeding, okay, you, you, those patients will die before they get to the hospital. So what we're trying to do is move the needle. Right? We're trying to, to take the patients, instead of just trying to focus on the patients that die in hospital, we're trying to get the ones that are bleeding faster and have more severe injuries and, and more aggressively treat them earlier to improve uh, outcomes. And it's patients like this. And this, this soldier survived. I took care of him uh, in Baghdad in 2004, October-ish. And you can't, you, know, you can't imagine, it's hard to imagine a patient like this surviving, right? But by pushing the needle and getting tourniquets on him very early on scene, uh, the medics got these tourniquets on him within uh, minutes. And back then, this is 2004, we didn't have whole blood pre-hospital. But the second he got into the cache, right, we were resuscitating aggressively with whole blood. That's what you see going through the catheter here. It definitely ain't crystallids. Uh, and we saved his life, okay? Uh, and it's, I still look at this picture 15 years later, and it's, it's uh, shocking. But this is what we're trying to do, save these patients, okay? Uh, and to do that, you have to be more aggressive and, and provide a hemostatic resuscitation pre-hospital. Oh, so we've heard a lot yesterday uh, about you know, the principle you know, of not taking a knife to a gunfight, right? Which basically means you, know, you don't want to be underprepared for a uh, high-stress, you know, high-risk situation. Well, if you, if you take that principle and think about it, you, know, you don't want to take crystalloids to a bloodbath, right? The same, same principle. You know? So Yosemite's got to bring, bring blood to that fight instead of uh, crystalloids. Um, and that's what we've been trying to promote. So now, what's, what are these statistics about preventable uh, deaths after traumatic injury? The data is US-based, but there's about 150,000 uh, US traumatic deaths in the US per year. 
when we've combined both military and, and civilian data on the rate of deaths pre-hospital and preventable deaths from hemorrhagic shock, pre-hospital and in-hospital, we've, we've estimated uh, with, with good data that there are 30,000 preventable deaths from he traumatic hemorrhage per year in the U.S. I mean, this is astronomical. It's huge. We don't realize how often people are bleeding to death in the States. And um, I, there may be some countries in Europe where this is not a problem, but I'm sure there are other countries uh, where it is the, the problem is this, uh, this big. And then you do the math. 25,000 of those 30,000 are dying pre-hospital. Okay? So, and I hope I'm, I'm, being, I'm not being subtle here, right? The problem is pre-hospital. And we have to get uh, blood products and tourniquets, dried plasma, TXA, etc., uh, to the pre-hospital setting. So the um, the bundle of care that we came up with uh, back in 2004, we uh, to reduce death from hemorrhagic shock, we called it damage control uh, resuscitation. And damage control is a long list of, of principles again aimed to reduce death from hemorrhage. You know, what's probably what's most important is recognizing who uh, is at risk of having life-threatening uh, life hemorrhagic shock. It's super simple when they're a triple amputee, right? But you can have a grade 5 liver uh, lack and not really recognize it until it's, it's too late. So we have to come up with methods to identify who might be at risk of, uh, of traumatic hemorrhage, of life-threatening hemorrhage. And, you know, point-of-care devices. Uh, there are some groups up the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, is using NEARS technology. They say uh, for them, if the NEARS is less than 65, 70%, those are the patients that are going to wind up being uh, in hemorrhagic shock. Um, in, in Baghdad, we were using uh, INR at level one and level two uh, aid stations. They make point of care devices to measure INR and, and lactate. I know there are a lot of um, special forces units and the other uh, civilian EMS programs using lactate uh, pre-hospital to identify those at risk of bleeding. Preventing hypothermia, that's a no-brainer. Uh, hemorrhage control with mechanical hemostatic adjuncts, right? Tourniquets have clearly uh, come back for very good reason, and there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the past 15 years with their use, and I think reintroduction back into the civilian uh, world as well. The use of uh, hemostatic uh, gauze as well um, is helpful than, a, than using a non-hemostatic uh, gauze. Reboa, we heard a lot, we heard about that uh, yesterday, and I think um, will have a more of a place in the future of being used pre-hospital with appropriate training. There's a, there are investigational products too, intra-abdominal foams that can be injected blindly in the field. They expand and stop the bleeding while not reducing venous return, interestingly. Uh, that will be a big help uh, in the future because it's really, it's truncal bleeding that most of our patients are dying from now. And that may help in the future. Hemostatic resuscitation is the term used to describe the whole blood-based uh, resuscitation uh, for hemorrhagic shock compared to uh, crystalloids. You know, we believe uh, that uh, whole blood is optimal, but if uh, in, hos in hospital, if you don't have whole blood available, trying to reconstitute whole blood uh, one, uh, in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio with red cells, plasma, and platelets is, I think, the next uh, best thing uh, in general. Although I will say, based upon you know, the conversation we had yesterday, in some people's hands, in some systems' hands, using uh, factor concentrates and fibrinogen and TXA can work uh, prob probably just as well, uh, too. Permissive hypotension, I really cringe when I say that phrase because it's really more about it's permissive um, uh, resuscitation with crystalloids. A lot of that data we saw yesterday they weren't targeting a blood pressure in their trials. They were e either giving clear fluids or not, right? So it's really, um, we feel it's, it's probably better if you're using blood uh, to resuscitate, to aim for a higher blood pressure, maybe around 100 or so, if you don't have traumatic brain injury. Uh, so you still don't want them to be hypertensive ever. Uh, but shooting for a... Um, a blood pressure that's around a, a hundred or so. I'm sure uh, Gare and Pat will talk about that later as well. Clearly avoiding crystalloid resuscitation, right? You know, but oh, when you give LR or normal saline, all you, you are in increasing the blood pressure temporarily, initially. You may be popping the clot if, you, if your blood pressure goes too high, and you're causing a dilutional coagulopathy, 
So for those that patients that are at risk of exsanguinating, you're really, in the end, not helping them. It be, may be fine for a patient who might live for the next six hours anyway to get to a surgeon to correct the, um, the, the bleed. Um, but it also causes an endothelial injury too. Crystalloids are actually more pro-inflammatory compared to plasma. People always think plasma is dangerous. Uh, that causes more of an inflammatory injury. Actually, when you, in animal models, uh, it doesn't. Um, Tranexamic acid, a source of fibrinogen, uh, and avoiding hypocalcemia. When you give a lot of blood products uh, that are in citrate, uh, you're going to ha you can have severe uh, hypocalcemia. Calcium is a cofactor for hemostasis, so you want to try to keep the calcium normal uh, too. So what's some of the data uh, regarding the use of blood products pre-hospital? This was a very interesting publication by Stacy Shackelford, a U.S. Army surgeon. It's a retrospective study, so it has sources of bias within it. Uh, it, it, does, it can't, um, we can't claim causality from this trial. But in this uh, study of about 400 patients, where they matched them by, according to severity of injury, uh, physiologic factors, etc., those patients that received uh, blood products pre-hospital, predominantly just red cells, some of them got plasma, but mainly red cells, had a dramatic reduction uh, in death uh, compared to those that received um, crystalloids. So some decent, I would call it moderate quality data, supporting the use of blood products pre-hospital to improve uh, outcomes. Jason Sperry out of Pittsburgh in a civilian population uh, also just reported in a randomized trial that the use of plasma pre-hospital was improving uh, survival for patients uh, that received uh, standard uh, care. So a fairly large randomized controlled trial published in the New England Journal uh, indicating pre-hospital plasma can improve uh, outcomes. I don't have a slide for it, I apologize. There was a second study, a combat trial done by the Denver group. That study that also compared pre-hospital plasma to crystalloids, they did not show a difference in survival. But when you look, read the two papers closely, you'll notice that the Denver study, patients were um, much less sicker. The ISS was maybe in the 17, 18 range, and don't quote me on that, but the, and the ISS in the Pittsburgh study was in the high 20s. But probably more importantly, the transport time was much shorter in the Denver group compared to the Pittsburgh group too. So yes, plasma may not help you if you're not, if you're not that sick and have very short transport times, but the Pittsburgh study did show a difference. And then when it comes to the platelets, a secondary analysis of the proper study, which was the large randomized control trial comparing different ratios, did show when patients received some platelets compared to patients that received no platelets, there was better survival for patients that received platelets. Now you might say to me, Phil, well, no shit, right? These are patients that are, that are bleeding. Uh, of course, when you give platelets, it makes a difference. Okay, but this is a, a pragmatic study in a way, because actually, I would, it depends upon where you live, but about 60 to 80 percent of, of hospitals in a large region do not have access to platelets. Okay, many of us are very centric to the, the trauma centers that we work in, right, or the large tertiary care centers that we work in, and we have access to platelets, so this is it's never a problem the vast majority of, of hospitals do not have access to platelets because of their half-life, I mean their shelf life of five days. So this, what this tells you is that those hospitals that don't have access to platelets, we gotta find a way to get them platelets uh, because it clearly makes a difference. Um, and we'll talk more about that at some point. I forget which lecture it's in. And then, you know, clearly time is money, right? Again, a lot of the stuff is obvious, but it's great when you have data to support what would seems uh, to be obvious. Oops. This, again, was another secondary analysis from the proper trial, showing that uh, for every minute that there was a delay in getting any blood product to the patient, there was a 5% increased risk of death. Okay? So if you delay products uh, by, by two minutes, you know, there's a 10% increased risk of death. Uh, so time is money, some data. To support it. So, for our patients with traumatic, uh, trauma-induced uh, blood failure, we, we basically, if we agree, and hopefully we do, that with, we need uh, hemorrhagic, hemostatic resuscitation is needed for patients who present with shock, endothelial dysfunction, coagulopathy, etc. 
right? I, I hope we all agree crystalloids is not the best thing for those patients. I realize there are limitations in your system, system then if it's all that you have, it's all, it's all you have, and what you need to do is move your systems to get away from, from crystalloids. But I think we can agree physiologically, if you're bleeding to death, you don't want to give them crystalloids, or even simple colloids, you want to give them blood products to reverse the blood failure. So if you're going to do that, you have two main ways you can go, two roads you can go down. You can go down the whole blood approach, or you can try to reconstitute it with red cells, plasma, uh, and platelets. I think in the pre-hospital setting, it's, a, it's, it's not a choice. It's not even a discussion, not even a debate. You have to use whole blood. Why would you ever want to bring three products pre-hospital? You might say, well, fine, I'll just bring red cells and plasma. If you don't give them platelets, for those that are bleeding the most, that triple amputee kind of patient, you're not going to save that patient if you don't have platelets available. Um, so you have two choices, whole blood or go with uh, components. So is it back to the future with whole blood? Right? Nothing that within DCR, almost nothing is new. Very little is new. Is this all going back to World War I um, resuscitation principles? And it's been published. Uh, Pat has a great chapter coming out in our textbook that goes through all of this. This is all very well known in World War I. We've forgotten it. Or we've allowed the blood banking uh, industry to pull us away from whole blood, giving us components. And then we were kind of trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. So before we talk about whole blood, it's really important to, to give some definitions and to provide the perspective. Whole blood can either be warm and, warm and fresh. A lot of our military data that we published was with warm. Uh, whole blood is often transfused within eight hours, and um, although it can be stored for 24 at, at room temp. Uh, it's, in addition to warm whole blood, there's cold stored whole blood. Okay, that is a licensed product in the EU. Uh, and it's licensed uh, by the FDA and the uh, US. Uh, it's stored between 2 to 6 degrees Celsius. It can be stored up to 35 days according to current uh, regulations. And some of the civilian data coming out now, or most of it now coming out now, is cold stored. So while they're clearly similar products, uh, you have to they are different. And when you read the literature, you have to know what you're reading. Whole blood can be ABO specific. Early in the war, when I was giving it in Baghdad, we were uh, aiming to make it uh, ABO uh, specific. Uh, since then, we've transitioned to make it more uh, easily available. We're going with low titer O whole blood. So most of the uh, cold store data that you'll see now is with group O uh, whole blood instead of it being ABO specific. I'm going to talk about the differences in a few more slides. When we say late low titer, it's got to be at least less than uh, uh, 256 for anti-A and anti-B. So this, uh, the, the re, um, rediscovery of whole blood came with our first publication in 2009, a retrospective study, got uh, tons of bias within it, although the groups were really equal when it came to severity of injury, ISS, base deficit, INR, location of injury. The only difference between the two groups was that the group that got whole blood, 30% of their blood volume transfused was whole blood. Uh, the, Component therapy group got red cells, plasma, and platelets. Even though the ratios of products were similar between the, the two groups. And you can see a 13% absolute uh, improvement in survival for those that received whole blood. So this made many people go, shit, maybe those guys are right. Or maybe, this, maybe there could be something to this. Because up until this point, it was just a bunch of crazy guys downrange doing shit that we weren't supposed to be doing. And it was having the US Army uh, mil uh, uh, leadership was really getting uh, concerned about it, and it was causing a big problem. We published this, and it made all the, all the noise kind of die, die down. It's also uh, interesting uh, to note that when you look at this study, the, when, you, when you give components compared to whole blood, there's a lot more anticoagulants and additives uh, within it. And when we calculated how much that would be, there was basically 800 mLs more uh, within those that received components compared uh, to whole blood. Um, Sean Nesson and I, with a few other people, also uh, looked at whole blood in a Roll 2 hospital, which is basically a, um, a 
smaller um, surgical hospital that has limited capability. And here again, too, the use of whole blood was associated with improved uh, survival, uh, both using it or not, and then according to um, how much you used. I'll go faster because Gare's telling me I'm out of time already. And then we have another analysis coming out soon. It's not published yet, but this is with 1,000 patients again, using propensity matching to, com to compare those that received whole blood versus not, and a strong association with, with survival when uh, fresh whole blood is used compared to not. This is uh, warm whole blood, not, not cold stored. Now, you might say, well, Phil, well, that's great, but that's all retrospective data. I don't believe it until you do a trial. Well, you know what? There's, there are RCTs out there. They're in the pediatric population. They're not in trauma, but in uh, children that require cardiac surgery that have severe bleeding, where I trained in Philadelphia, they did a trial back in 1991. And the children that received cold whole blood, it was only stored for up to 48 hours, uh, compared to giving uh, components in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, there was much less blood loss uh, for cold stored uh, blood versus uh, components. And there was even, it was associated with uh, better platelet aggregation in the cold stored group. So there is some RCT data supporting uh, whole blood superiority compared to components. And then this is an unpublished study out of the, uh, the Norwegian group. Uh, GARE has led this, uh, this trial. This is with uh, cold apheresis platelets, but it supports the fact that uh, in a randomized controlled trial again, of adult cardiac surgery patients, cold stored platelets have less blood loss as well, uh, less chest tube output compared to those receiving room temperature uh, platelets. So, you know, a, a one of the biggest problems uh, with going with cold stored whole blood is that people said those, those platelets are not functional. Uh, they actually, they are uh, more functional. We've known that since the late 60s, early 70s, when they, they even did a randomized controlled trial of comparing warm to cold platelets in adults that were either thrombocytopenic uh, from uh, having cancer and chemotherapeutic agents, or they were thrombocytopenic, um, or they had low platelet function from being on aspirin. And in this trial, cold platelets, again, had a much better correction of bleeding time uh, compared to when warm platelets were used. So we've known for decades that a cold sore platelet is more hemostatically active, at least two RCTs showing it. So the fact that platelets are stored cold in whole blood should not prevent you from using whole blood. If anything, it should be the motivation to use it. But there's even some you know, potential problems with using warm platelets. This is a retrospective study that Kenji and Alba at a USC did. And when you see as the storage duration of warm platelets uh, goes up, there's increased risk of, of basically sepsis. The, the, this was a composite uh, outcome, uh, a morbidity outcome, but it was primarily uh, sepsis. Is that to try to get me to go faster? Here's a, so this is an important slide, so I'm going to have to spend time on it. When you think about the advantages uh, uh, of low titer O whole blood compared to a blood components, when the, it's a more potent uh, product. I showed you, well, I guess I'll show you the slide in a second or two. When you don't have to split whole blood up into components, it has a much higher hemoglobin, factor concentrations, and, and platelet uh, count. So it's more concentrated. You'll have more efficacy in re reversing blood failure. I've just talked about cold platelets and uh, improved hemostasis. You can now actually wind up increasing the storage of platelets by at least three times as much. Warm platelets can only be stored for five days. A cold store platelet, you have probably at least up to 15 days at the minimum to get equivalence compared to a warm uh, platelet. So the fact now that you can triple your storage duration means you can now start putting those platelets out at those hospitals that don't have them now where patients are currently dying of bleeding. Okay, so the availability of a, a cold store platelet product dramatically increases when you go with low titer or whole blood. And this might be the biggest factor that improves outcomes uh, for patients because it will allow us to put whole blood or cold platelets in places where they're not available now. It's actually even safer to use a group O whole blood compared to trying to give uh, individual blood components. And that's just due to um, uh, human um, factors, making a mistake, right? When we try to type uh, red cells after we use maybe the first few units of, uh, of, o, of o negative red cells, then we try to switch to give them ABO-specific red cells. Human error 
leads to a 1 in 80,000 risk of a severe tr uh, transfusion reaction, which can cause uh, death. When you give group O whole blood, those red cells are always O. They don't change. They, they can, we continue using it throughout the resuscitation. So there's no risk of a severe hemolytic reaction. If anything, there's a risk of incompatible plasma when you're giving group O whole blood, but we do that every day with platelets, right? And you do it often with group A plasma to the group B and AB patients. So incompatible plasma is not, uh, doesn't cause any fatal reactions. So it's safer to give a group O whole blood than to use components where you wind up switching to uh, ABO compatible products. With cold whole blood, there's no bacterial contamination risk. When you use warm platelets, okay, that have plasma in it, there's a bacterial contamination risk. Okay, one in 5,000 units are contaminated with, uh, with a bacterial agent. Um, and then the, the logistic advantages, right? All those of you, all of us that resuscitate patients, okay, it's much easier to give one product compared to, compared to three, especially in the pre-hospital setting. Data on cold stored whole blood having better aggregation. I'll go through that faster. I'll, go, I'll skip past that. This is just showing you that uh, components, when you, add, when you add them all back together, you wind up getting a very uh, dilute product compared to just using whole blood. Here we did the math. And there's, again, just as I showed you in our, in our trial, or in our retrospective study, there's about 800 mLs more of anticoagulants and additives when you give components. That anticoagulant citrate, that's not good for a bleeding patient, right? That's going to anticoagulate them. But that's what we're doing when we give components compared uh, to whole blood. I talked about that already. Um, up until a year or two ago, people would say, Phil, this is great, but I'm not allowed to give it. The standards don't allow for group O whole blood to, uh, to be used. So we said, fine, we're not going to let that stop us. Andre, myself, and Mark Yezer, uh for the Thor organization, lobbied the ABB, and within three months, we got them to change the standards. And now uh, Group O whole blood is an acceptable uh, blood product to be used. And I imagine in Europe, it's the same thing. Um, it's being used now. Since we've changed the standards, we've dramatically uh, increased the use of whole blood in the US and, are, and in some places around the world. Uh, in Norway, uh, at Hawkland University, they're using it for their trauma patients. Uh, in Israel, they're using it throughout the entire country in their pre-hospital uh, uh, system. And many large uh, centers in the U.S. are now using whole blood. The number is actually up to 25 uh, now. We just did a survey, and 25% of hospitals have no limit on how much they're using. Since these programs are just starting to use whole blood, some of them have chose this to only uh, limit the amount that they're using. Uh, the mean is four, but some are going up to eight. And then 75% are using it for trauma only. The other 25% are recognize that a patient that has hemorrhagic shock has hemorrhagic shock. They're all, whether it's obstetric hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage, post-operative uh, bleeding from liver surgery, cardiac surgery. If you're exsanguinating, you're exsanguinating. And they're giving whole blood to those patients too. And by them doing that, it does make it easier for them to maintain an inventory and to use it within uh, their system. Um, there are some places that are using a lot of, of whole blood so far in the past year or two. Uh, Bergen has passed 100 patients so far, and in San Antonio, you know, uh, close to, to 300 as well, too. And again, in San Antonio, the majority of patients actually don't have trauma uh, when they're using it for, for massive uh, bleeding. So in conclusion, uh, whole blood-based resuscitation, uh, I feel, is optimal for trauma-induced uh, blood failure. Um, and I think it's optimal compared to one to one to one for logistic efficacy and safety reasons. Um, and the pre-hospital benefit is better than not. I have a few more slides. Uh, what's the future, right? Because you can imagine bringing a low titer O whole blood pre-hospital in liquid form still has some logistical constraints. It's liquid, you have to keep it cold. Uh, in Washington University in St. Louis, uh, we've started a company and we're, we are developing a nanoparticle-based artificial red cell that can be freeze-dried. And so far in, in rabbits, it's, it's, it's working similarly to rabbit uh, red cells. We have a long way to go, but uh, it's, it's, it's um, very um, exciting to think about ultimately one day having an artificial red cell that's freeze-dried. I say artificial red cell, not HBOC, because uh, this nanoparticle, 
uh, is packed with hemoglobin, 2,3-DPG, the methemoglobin reductase system, and the uh, shell is impervious to nitric oxide. It's basically, we have re-engineered a red cell that is, is freeze-dried. And uh, when you think about that, and the fact that you could add it with uh, dried plasma, and there's even dried platelets in phase three trials now, we can have a dried whole blood equivalent in the next five to six years. That really uh, helps uh, the pre-hospital systems, and even uh, in hospitals. So that's you know, where we're going in the future. People always ask, how do I get my Thor swag, right? You know, in the past, you'd have to beg Gary, he'd bring you a t-shirt and stuff like that. So if you want to buy Thor gear, you can, now we're selling it on our website. So you can get your hat that Gary loves to wear, your Viking Law t-shirt, etc. cetera. So uh, that's where you get your stuff. Limerick Bills, where the idea of Thor started, you know, and uh, we say all the time, you know, blood is for bleeding, salt water is for cooking pasta, right? And, and beer is for drinking. Thank you. Thanks.